All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I've actually never been to a Petrie Flom event before, although I've you know, sat them out in envy for years. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about a select number of patent events that have happened over the past 12 months and a few that may or may not happen in the coming months. And then my much abler colleagues are going to flesh out everything and explain all of the nuances and answer every question that you can possibly have. I'm just going to raise questions for you. <clears throat> oh, I should say that um, nothing that I say this morning uh, can be attributed to the Broad Institute. It is just my own opinions. So um, hopefully I won't say anything silly, but if I do. Slides, oh, yeah, please. Thank you. This That's small great. window. In theory? No? What about the window view? Okay, I'm gonna let you do it since you know what you're doing. There we go. Let's see if I can get maximum size here. The view full screen. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So again, don't attribute this to the Broad, attribute this just to me. So the first case I want to talk about is the Helsin healthcare case, Supreme Court case. And this case um, had to do with an anti-nausea drug called Aloxy or um, Polonocetron, which I rendered on the right-hand side for those of you who like um, ball and stick diagrams. Um, this is an anti-nausea drug which is given to a select group of patients after chemotherapy to suppress nausea and other symptoms. Um, by a confidential agreement, MGI Pharmaceutical got the right to sell Aloxy, but early in the development of the drug um, in the US. Two years later, two year, roughly two years after this negotiation and agreement um, were finalized, Helsin filed a provisional patent application and disclosed two specific doses of the Aloxy. And this eventually issued as the 219 patent. Um, Teva decided that it wanted to manufacture generic Aloxy. And this case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, interpreted a provision of the American Vents Act, um, a provision of law which had already been settled before the AIA, but decided that pre-AIA law having to do with, um, having to do with um, offers for sale, sales, et cetera, would also pertain after the AIA. So not terribly exciting, but sort of a confirmation that the law would stay the way that it had been before the AIA. Second case I want to talk about is the Athena Diagnostics case versus Mayo Collaborative. Um, Athena was the exclusive licensee in the US of a particular diagnostic or set of diagnostic methods of myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is a sort of neurodegenerative disease that manifests in two specific ways in a molecular sense. One of the ways happens in 80% of patients and the other way happens in 20% of patients. And in the 20% of patients, um, a, a muscle-specific tyrosine kinase known as MUSK was implicated. And this patent had to do with that 20%, the, the MUSK-related patients. Um, Mayo decided that it would develop competing tests to diagnose whether you were in the 80% or the 20%, whether you were a MUSK patient or not. And Athena, Athena sued Mayo for infringement of the A20 patent that Athena had um, licensed. And Mayo invoked the defense of invalidity under statutory subject matter, section 101, um, a section that my, my colleagues will speak about, I think, in much more detail in a second. Um, the district court agreed that the diagnostic method was invalid, not an uncommon finding after Mayo versus Prometheus, the Supreme Court case and the Alice case. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit affirmed, um, and in sort of an interesting move, decided not to rehear the case on Bonk. So they just stayed with the panel decision. The Supreme Court is currently considering whether to grant cert. It's taking a little bit longer, I think, than is. Oh, no, no. I'm just saying they're, never, they're not going to grant cert. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, no, no decision yet. But um, as I said, you'll probably get answers to the questions I raise. Um, and just on the right here, this is just, this is the, the Musk um, 
this is the musk protein. It spans the membrane, which is the little gray line, but just for those of you that like proteins and know where, knowing where they are in the cell, this is what the musk looks like. So we'll get a final answer, um, you know, either by default with no cert or with cert, but it doesn't look good for these types of strictly diagnostic claims. Now, um, there's the Restasis case, which had to do with um, Mylan intending to sell a generic version of Restasis and instituting an IPR, essentially an administrative review of the Restasis patents. And Allergan, um, who had the rights to Restasis and the, to these patents, thought that it was being very clever, I imagine, by transferring ownership to the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, which is, I believe, up on the border between New York State and Quebec. And the move was meant to essentially protect these patents from administrative review and from court review because of tribal sovereign immunity. Um, the PTAB, the administrative court in the patent office, rejected the defense and essentially said that um, instruments such as patents did not qualify for tribal sovereign immunity. There was also a question in the case about whether this transfer was legitimate or whether it was just sort of a trick to keep the patents from being challenged. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit affirmed the PTAB and the Supreme Court denied cert. And so tribal sovereign immunity, I don't think is going to be the magic bullet for uh, brand drug companies who want to protect their patents from review either in the courts or in the PTAB in the future. Now we get to sort of an interesting um, hybrid claim in a patent, what some people call theranostic claims. So therapy claims and diagnostic claims. And I can't claim um, that I came up with that clever phrase, but it's a diagnostic claim that also can be applied in therapy. So the Hikma Pharmaceuticals case, um, Hikma is a relatively new name for the company. Um, I think in a, in a move to improve their public relations, they changed their name to Hikma relatively late in the litigation. So Hikma versus Vanda. Um, Vanda sells a schizophrenia drug. Uh, the trade name's Fanapt, and the actual chemical name is Iloperidone. And again, I've rendered it to the right in case you're interested. The use here um, in Theranostics was claimed in a patent, the 610 patent. A, a patient was essentially genotyped to calculate the dosage of the iloperidone to be administered. And depending on the genotype, more or less dosage would be applied. So the district court held that the patent satisfied section 101, um, particularly under Alice and the, the Mayo Prometheus um, diet of cases. So under the Alice and Mayo Prometheus cases, um, there was some attempt by the court to articulate what might be patentable, a sort of a two-step type claim. The district court here was satisfied that there were two steps here. There was a diagnostic step, and then there was a conceptually distinct um, therapeutic step. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, a divided Court of Appeals, did affirm the district court. And then the USPTO started to follow um, what they defined to be the new rule based on the district court and the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit decisions and actually articulate rules that were pushed out to patent attorneys to, it appeared, allow these type of two-step claims. So I believe, I don't think the empirical evidence is, is good yet, but I believe there's been an uptick in Theranostic claims since, since this decision, or since these two decisions. Now again, the Supreme Court's considering cert in this case, and it's an important case because it would seem to be a shot over the bow of especially Mayo versus Prometheus, which a lot of people thought was settled law in the Supreme Court, but we'll, we'll see how that develops. Um, I put this up here because, as you probably heard in numerous places in the media, there's an increasing number of patents which are falling off the cliff, the expiration cliff. So assuming that they're not challenged and invalidated before these dates, here are patents which will die natural deaths, including um, Simbrinza, which as of tomorrow goes off patent. But there's a number of patents that will go off, um, go off patent over the next uh, 12 months or so, the next eight or nine months or so. Um, this list, by the way, is from the website Drug Patent Watch. 
which I think is a great website if you're interested in expirations, not just for patent reasons, but also for FDA regulatory protection reasons. So the last two things I want to mention very briefly is aside from patents, there is an entire field of innovation, of patient innovation, medical innovation, which deliberately ignores patents. Um, I sort of here inelegantly put it as patentless innovation. Some people call it user innovation, open innovation, collaborative innovation, or most recently free innovation, was coined by Eric von Hippel to sort of capture this phenomenon. Um, I had the great fortune of, of working with um, these authors at the bottom on an article that uh, is fortunately for you only about four pages long, and it's freely available on SSRN. It's from the MIT Management Review, in which we sort of review um, the movement and review examples of patentless patient innovation. And an example to the, um, to the left-hand side is this is an artificial pancreas. It's an artificial pancreas created by a patient named Dana Lewis, who. I've, I've had the occasion to meet and talk to over the past couple of years as she's developed this. Um, I'm not advocating that you develop artificial organs, artificial pancreas in particular, but what I do want to sort of tag and flag is that this is going on, and there's a very strong philosophy associated with this of keeping things free from patents and keeping the designs open and available to all on YouTube and other places on the web so that folks that don't want to spend money on proprietary or patent covered devices for medical device companies, for example, could make their own, providing they have the technical expertise. So there's a Raspberry Pi and there's a commercially available blood glucose monitor, et cetera. So this is just one example, the artificial pancreas, lots of other really interesting innovation work going in um, to other medical devices and even drugs. Again, I'm not advocating it, um, but I'm just, I want you to be aware that this is another domain of innovation outside of the patent realm. The final thing that I'll mention is that I've been working on a project with um, Lisa Friedman and Jevin West. And this project has to do with pharmaceutical knowledge flow as measured through citations and patents. And I won't belabor this, but what I will say is that we have um, all the citations for all the patents and patent applications that have been published worldwide. So for about 203 countries, and we have about um, 600 million citations and about 230 patent publications or patents. And what's interesting with respect to pharmaceutical knowledge is, as you can see from this diagram, is that um, the blue countries, these are all the countries in the world arrayed around a radial diagram, the blue countries are in the upper left-hand quadrant. Blue countries are the source of a tremendous amount of pharmaceutical knowledge, at least measured through the patent system. There's a select number of developing countries, which are the red countries, which make up most of the circle, that either use or provide pharmaceutical knowledge, again, as measured through the patent citation system worldwide. Um, but you'll notice that in the bottom half or more of the diagram, there's very little flow of pharmaceutical knowledge, again, as mediated through patents and citations. But I think that it's quite a worry that for at least half the countries in the world, there's very little pharmaceutical knowledge flow that is traveling through the patent system, something that certainly could be, I think, improved. And I'm done. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jake Sherko. I'm a fellow here at the Petrie Flom Center and also at the Safra Center for Ethics uh, here at Harvard. I, I want to thank Andrew for beginning this morning with a really excellent observation that we now live in an age in which Raspberry Pi helps control insulin levels as opposed to make them go haywire. So that is, you know, learn something new every day. Um, Andrew talked a lot about Section 1 and medical diagnostics, and this is essentially what I'm going to be talking to you about now. Um, and I'm going to be going through one of the recent developments, which is essentially attempts to, uh, 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 congressional attempts to amend Section 101 to uh, uh, make sense, if that could be thought of it like that, uh, this 2014 Supreme Court decision called Alice, the incoherence of which you're about to hear from me shortly. Um, this is, I think, a perfect topic for the preview because I'm going both to review, that's the R in front of the P, what has happened on amending Section 101 thus far and what is likely to happen in the future, that's the P, that's the preview, right? So uh, first things first. Um, the eligibility statute, Section 101, as you'll hear from me, is truly unworkable in its current form. The second, 
uh, with respect to medical diagnostics is I think that fears surrounding negative public health consequences from it, that is by amending Section 101 to make it more robust to allow more patents in, I think that its broad effects on medical diagnostics are probably unfounded, right? Um, so th th these are essentially two points that I want you to consider when you're thinking about uh, Section 101, right? So uh, first, let's go through just a brief history of Section 101 so we can see where the bodies are buried for a second, right? Um, and this is how the current statute reads. Whoever invents or discovers any new and useful process machine manufacture or composition of matter may obtain a patent therefore, right? Um, so this seems like this would be helpful, but actually feel free to just completely ignore the language because the courts essentially have done this since the Patent Act was first uh, created in 1790, right? Um, instead, this statute has been interpreted in the following way essentially throughout United States history Anything under the sun made by man is patentable, save abstract ideas or natural laws, products, or phenomena, right? Sure, defining what a natural law is is tough, but it's not a phrase so devoid of application as to render it meaningless, right? Well, uh, like good things, all sensible but imperfect judicial doctrines eventually come to an end. And beginning in 2006, the Supreme Court began to decide a number of cases on Section 101 grounds, right? A number of these, LabCorp Metabolite, Mayo Collaborative, uh, the Myriad Genetics case many of you may be familiar with, right, dealt with in some form methods or things important for medical diagnostics. To wit, vitamin B deficiencies in LabCorp, uh, although this was uh, decided in a different procedural posture than the rest of these cases, uh, thiopurine doses in Mayo and breast cancer risk in Myriad, right? By invalidating the patents in these cases, although again, LabCorp decided uh, in a different procedural posture, commentators with an interest in public health noted that this freed clinicians and diagnosticians from running tests on their patients without taking a patent license or subjecting themselves to infringement. But these cases squared poorly with a number of the court's prior precedents, especially those concerning software. And as a consequence of that, rather than performing a house cleaning of sorts, this would have been a sensible thing for the Supreme Court to do, to you know, admit that it's wrong sometimes, right? Um, the court rather attempted to shoe fit its prior precedents into this Alice decision in 2014, which to date remains the authoritative interpretation of Section 101. What does Alice do? Alice requires courts to engage in a two-step analysis to assess eligibility, right? Step one, to determine wh whether the contested patent claim is directed to an otherwise ineligible abstract idea, such as an algorithm or computation or natural product. Step two, to then ask whether the claim adds, quote, something extra that embodies a, quote, inventive concept. I think if, uh, especially if you're a law student, the criticisms are self-evident, right? Defining ineligibility by first asking whether the patent is directed to something ineligible is literally circular, right? What does, quote, something extra mean? Is it a qualitative test? Is it a quantitative test? Nobody knows, right? Um, uh, what is an inventive concept? Like, like, what is that, generally speaking, when you're thinking about patent claims? Is it the collection of elements? Is it one particular element? Is it one element added to an otherwise uh, element uh, to which the two things have never been previously combined? Um, but to the extent that you don't believe that this is so unworkable, you need not take my word for it. Because since Alice, federal courts have struggled mightily to put it into practice. So let's take a couple of the examples, some of which Andrew had mentioned earlier, right? Take the Ariosa case, right? This is a revolutionary test for PGD aneuploidies, right? Valid or invalid? Invalid, right? All right. How about the Vanda case, right? Vanda versus Westwood Pharmaceuticals, right? This involved adjusting the dosage of a particular drug to a patient based on the allele of a particular enzyme, right? It sounds like HICMA, right? Nope, wrong, invalid, right? All right, all right. What about a method of freezing cells, right? You know, that, that, that sounds like that's like pretty basic. Valid, right? All right, all right, how about this? What about a method of manufacturing a vehicle drive shaft? Literally a mechanical engineering patent, the likes of which we have had for over 200 years here in the United States. 
Well, as of a couple of weeks ago, invalid, right? You might as well flip a coin. The result is, in the words of one former judge on the federal circuit, a, quote, swamp, a, quote, morass of words, unpredictable, save some empirical evidence that patent attorneys are slightly better than a coin flip, about 62% likely, to actually guess whether a patent is valid or invalid under Section 101. And if patent attorneys are only getting it right slightly more than half of the time, the rest of us are in deep trouble, right? But if you care about the rule of law, which I hear is in short supply these days, right? Uh, good results by haphazard means is worse than being predictably bad, right? All right, so now let's think about a counter argument, right? That clarifying section 101, that essentially amending section 101 to make it more explicit so that it's something other than random, will yield negative public health consequences by essentially patenting diagnostics and putting them out of the reach, at least financially so, of a number of patients and practitioners, right? That myriad, specifically this is the breast cancer risk case many of you may be familiar with, and single gene sequencing will like rise from the ashes and threaten the advance of genetic sequencing that we have come to expect. Or to counsel others to patent diagnostics, say like those in Vanda or Mayo or LabCorp, that will negatively impact the public health if they are expensive. I personally think that these fears are unfounded, but I think that this is true mainly for technical reasons, so technological reasons, I should probably say. With respect to Myriad, it is true that opening Section 101 again to Myriad-style claims will, for new genes at the least, allow them, right? But since the draft of the human genome, roughly about nine years after Myriad filed its BRCA1 and BRCA2 patents, there are no or incredibly few human genes left to be sequenced. Furthermore, many of the sequencing techniques that are used today, think Oxford Nanopore, do not actually create single genes, and therefore they do not infringe these particular patents as they would be claimed if Section 101 were amended to do just that. Rather, again, taking Oxford nanopore as an example, they are variants of long-range PCR or nanopore sequencing that read and compile long stretches of DNA instead. With respect to some of the diagnostic claims, it is true that opening Section 101 may lead to some of them being granted by the patent office, right? But you need to understand, as we'll hear about more in a moment, that Section 101 was not these patents' only deficiencies. A number of judges cast significant aspersions on Ariosa's patent, for example, under other sections of the patent statute, such as Section 112, which we'll hear more about from Claire in a moment, right? And Mayo, for all that it stands for, rested on some particularly shaky generalizations of that the data, uh, whether it was referenced in the specification, was in fact a natural law. In fact, the data that was referenced in the specification in Mayo was only true for patients less than half of the time. Odd to think of a law of nature that is not even true greater than 50% of the time. The truth is that patents fail Section 101, often fail other portions of the statute, and that if those sections are properly policed, and I understand that that's a big if, we would do much to check broad diagnostic patents on basic discoveries. That is, if the public health fear that's animating resistance to clarifying the patent eligibility statute, the truth is I, I don't think it's likely to be much of a threat, right? I want to be clear that this isn't to suggest that amending Section 101 bears no public health risk. To the contrary, they do, but they're likely to do so in a number of unexpected ways, right? Section 101 operates as a gatekeeper to the patent office, a coarse filter, so to speak, that seeks only to prevent from prosecution the most, un, the most uh, abstract or the most naturally co-equal inventions out there. The doctrine is not predicated on any particular understanding of the technology at any point in time. There is no person having ordinary skill in the art standard for Section 101 for assessing eligibility. To that end, what patent eligibility really is about, and this is the P part of my talk, is really about the future. It is a current assessment that abstractness, as it's defined today, will be abstractness 
tomorrow that gives incredible faith to the patent office and judges in ways that simply may be asking of them too much. So take the Myriad case, for example, when the patent statute was last substantively amended uh, in 1952, uh, or at least the, the patent, the substantive provisions of the patent statute last substantively amended in 1952, right? It was inconceivable that someday we would once sequence, quote unquote, a gene, that we would define its function, and that and we would have an assessment of its medical risk for something as complex as cancer. For those with an eye, ooh, I didn't want to do that. Almost there. Here we go. For those of you with an ear for history, I said 1952, you may recall that the molecular structure of DNA was not elucidated until a year later, April 25th, 1953. That is DNA day, right? So it would seem strange then that a sequence of something as particular as a gene of that nature was either abstract or equivalent to its natural product. Today, I don't think I'm stretching things too far by saying gene sequencing of single genes is routine. Or, in the parlance of Mayo, it is, quote, well understood, routine, conventional activity previously engaged in by researchers in the field, or WORCAP, BREF, if you want to use the acronym, right? That was a joke, no one actually uses that acronym, right? Furthermore, as technology progresses, the lines between what is abstract and concrete, or natural and synthetic, become increasingly blurry. Think if you're familiar with the technology of, I don't know, CRISPR, the revolutionary genome editing technology that is everybody's favorite thing now, right? Some important technical details aside, one could aptly conceive of it as really just two components of a natural system. You've got your nuclease, that is the DNA cutting enzyme, and you've got your guide RNA, the things that makes it specifically target a region in the genome. Today, we find the technology revolutionary as we must have thought of gene sequencing back in 1953, but tomorrow, it may be doing nothing more than the concept of finding some RNA-mediated nuclease and hitting the apply button. And perhaps that's correct, right? Perhaps that's instructive about doing too much violence to Section 101 as currently being proposed by Senators Coons and Tellus right now in the interest of public health. Eliminating Section 101 entirely allows broad, dramatic discoveries in health to be patented and augured by only a few, often well beyond what they've actually invented or discovered. Restricting it entirely, on the other hand, seems to kill the very sort of innovations that we, are, uh, we want to encourage the patent system to foster if we're going to have a patent system at all. That's a topic for another panel. Right? Therefore, not readily being able to predict the future, the prudent course, and in this sense I would actually agree with both Senators Coons uh, and Tillis for their draft bill, seems to amend the statute in some form, specifically to clarify the Alice case that I talked about earlier, even at the risk of reviving Myriad or Mayo style claims, but not to make it so broad as to be less a filter and more of just a sieve, right? There are a few proposals just to do that, and I'm more than happy to talk about those in the Q&A, but for those of you interested, there's two out right now. One is from the American Bar Association, another is from the AIPLA, the uh, Association for Intellectual Property Law, right? But they really have received little traction. We will see whether they gain more traction in 2020, okay? Thank you very much. Normally I present from PowerPoint slides. All right, so I'm Claire Laporte. Uh, I am head of intellectual property at Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a synthetic biology company. Um, that means that we make organisms that do all different kinds of things. Um, they can make uh, fragrances, they can um, synthesize cannabinoids in the same way that you would brew beer. Uh, and we can also make medications uh, using this technology. Um, so I work in the midst of the largest synthetic biology laboratory in the world, which is out in the dry dock. Um, and uh, so I have um, a, a mixed view of this because we're very interested in doing all kinds of research of all kinds of gene sequences uh, all over the world, um, yet at the same time, you know, we, we need to be able to 
finance a business. Uh, our business is a startup, and we have not yet figured out exactly how we're going to make money at this. Uh, and so the patent system is something that is very important. So I'm going to focus on uh, something that has been touched on earlier today called the written description requirement, which is, um, I know you've heard a lot of stuff that sounds pretty obscure. This is even more obscure than that. However, uh, I'm going to work to try to make it intelligible. So the thing on the left, by the way, is what patents look like these days when they come out. I receive a couple of these uh, every few weeks, and it's quite gratifying when you get this thing with the seal on it and everything. Um, but it is becoming increasingly difficult to, uh, to figure out how you can actually, first of all, get one of these, and secondly, when you get one, if it's actually going to be worth anything in another five years because the Supreme Court keeps changing the law. So um, the part of it that I'm going to focus on is called Section 112. It's another one of those things that uh, it's, it's another um, criterion that you have to be successful in meeting to be able to get a patent. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you've already gathered from this morning's discussion, patents are extremely important in protecting all kinds of biological inventions, particularly pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, there's been a great deal of mechanical invention that has happened over the past two centuries, uh, but biology is something that is actually still referred to as an unpredictable art. It's really very difficult to make new biological inventions, and so there's a very long time frame for developing things, during which time you need some investment, you need some way to kind of keep your company uh, afloat while you are working on developing this new biological invention. So section 112 says that the specification, which is the part of a patent that explains what you've invented, needs to contain a written description of the invention. OK, well, that seems pretty reasonable that you should have to describe what you're patenting. Um, but uh, the way that this has been applied is actually interesting. Um, it, what the courts have said is that the specification has to kind of show or prove that you've actually invented the full scope of what is in the business part of your patent. That is what called the claims of the patent. And patent claims are the actual scope of your legal monopoly. So you can describe all kinds of stuff in your patent, but the part that actually excludes other people from doing something, that's called the claims. And what this area of the law is all about is saying, what you're claiming, does it match with what you've actually described? So the rationale for this is that uh, this area of law allows the public to determine what falls within the scope of the claims, because you have to look at the specification to understand what that legal monopoly is. Um, and that should prevent inventors from gaining a broader monopoly than what they've actually contributed to science. Um, so one case uh, referred to this as operating to ensure fair play in the presentation of claims. And I think that that's actually a really good way to think about it. Um, now, a lot of the law on this has had sort of special additional things that have come up in connection with DNA-related inventions. So let me give you a sense of like a, a DNA-related invention that my company might patent. Uh, we, are, um, we are in the process of making uh, cannabinoids um, using uh, essentially plant enzymes, uh, and we can use those to, to make cannabinoids using other organisms. So all of the enzymes, those are proteins uh, that actually catalyze chemical reactions, all the proteins uh, that through many steps actually allow you to get to a cannabinoid um, have to be designed, developed, and put in that organism to get you to the point where you can brew cannabinoids in the way that you can brew beer. And that would be a nice thing because, of course, there's a heavy demand for cannabinoids and uh, their cultivation as plants is not very environmentally uh, sound. Um, so, you know, uh, when I am working on things like this, I have to really think about how I'm going to describe what we have done and make sure that I sort of cover it broadly enough so that I can actually get claims that are going to cover my invention and uh, exclude others in this highly competitive field from uh, essentially being able to draft off what we have invested in and invented. So as applied to DNA, uh, 
the adequate written description that's required by the law um, essentially requires a precise structural formula. So this is really important. We get into some of these sort of this or that things in the law. Is it like uh, substance or procedure? This one uh, is a distinction between structure and function. So um, the essence of this often is that uh, a great number of inventions in the past have been protected using largely functional language. In other words, I am uh, going to make a claim to a thing that does something that I've discovered that you can do in this way. All right, so I'll explain more about how that works. Um, for these functionally defined genuses, uh, and that means a, a group of things, the written description has to demonstrate that the applicant, that means the person who's trying to get a patent, has invented enough of these to actually say, yes, I can claim more than that single one that I'm talking about. So in other words, if you want to get a patent claim that covers more than just one narrow thing that other people might be able to compete with easily, you have to give a lot of different examples that are diverse to be able to give yourself enough protection so that you can actually claim something that's broader than just one narrow example. And a definition by function, uh, the courts have said, does not suffice to define the genus because it's only an indication of what the gene does rather than what it is, i.e. its structure. Okay, so just to illustrate um, the, the fairness point behind this, because I, I don't want to lose this. So my perspective right now is, I'm trying to get patent protection for our inventions because you know we're running a business, we're trying to get to the point where biological engineering can actually be profitable in an area other than pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that's really hard. Um, so I need to be able to claim enough so that I have some real competitive advantage over others. Um, however, uh, there's also the fairness consideration that if I really only invent one thing or a couple of narrow things, I shouldn't be able to claim the entire universe. So this is an example I used to use in litigation. My previous career, I was a trial lawyer. Uh, and um, uh, so let's say that I've discovered gold at these two addresses. Um, I might be able to get a claim to the gold located at these two addresses. Um, but then if I try to get uh, a claim to all the gold in California, that might be a bit of an overreach. So mm -hmm. that's sort of an illustration of the concept behind this. But then it's super difficult for me if I've really discovered gold at these two addresses and it might take me months or even years to demonstrate that I can use the same technique to find gold all up and down California. By that time, somebody else might have beat me to the patent office and the millions of dollars that I've already invested go down the drain. Okay, so clearly it's too broad to say all the gold in California, but is it totally fair to limit inventors to exactly and only what they discovered so that a competitor can make a tiny tweak and escape infringement? Now, there are other things you can argue about here. There's a thing called the doctrine of equivalence. Um, that is even more obscure than this, so I'm not going to go there. But suffice it to say that uh, it's not something that I, as uh, a patent holder, want to be relying on. OK, so let's now apply this to a specific medical situation, which is antibodies. Um, almost all of the biologics, uh, all, almost all of the significant medicines that people take these days for cancer uh, and for a lot of serious arthritic conditions uh, and many other diseases as well are engineered antibodies. Now these are things that take a very, very long time to develop, an enormous amount of money and a huge, almost miraculous scientific effort. I mean, I am not a scientist actually, and when I went through the business of understanding what it takes to make an engineered antibody. It's just mind boggling. So the way that it works in nature is that uh, your body makes antibodies and those bind to what are called in the medical uh, or the, the biopharma industry a target or an antigen. So let's say that a pathogen enters your body. Um, your uh, immune system actually has a way of uh, having something that will bind to that and replicate itself, get even better at binding, and eventually crush that invader from your body. So a lot of modern medicine actually is using that same concept to attack other problems in your body, such as cancerous cells. Um, and so 
one of the most critical aspects of modern pharmaceutical development is understanding the target that you want to go after. So when I look at the companies around Kendall Square, the vast majority of them are focused on discovering not so much uh, how to make the antibody uh, as what the target is, because actually making antibodies to a target is a fairly routine thing. Once you determine your target, you can make antibodies by fairly well-known steps using genetically engineered mice, um, screening uh, the resulting antibodies that arise in the body of the mouse to find the best ones. And then there's also a, a complex series of steps after that. But it is known how to do that. So um, by 2008, making antibodies was so routine that the Patent and Trademark Office actually issued guidance uh, and examples of how to deal with this written description requirement that said, you know what, once you've discovered your target, you can get whatever antibodies you want to that target. Um, and they issued guidance to the patent getting public, like me, back in 2008, saying that you could get a claim to any antibody that bound to your particular target. Um, because it's routine, the, uh, the target or the antigen is adequately defined and so forth. However, because of this sort of uh, pendulum swing away from patents, um, things uh, started to, uh, th these, these doctrines that say, look, you can't claim the world if you've only invented this one little thing, started to be applied pretty rigorously in this antibody context. So it started from my perspective in 2014 with a case called AbbVie versus Janssen, where um, an antibody patent uh, that related to a drug on the market for psoriatic arthritis, which if you suffer from that is not fun, um, the uh, patent that protected that drug um, was one of those ones that said, okay, I've got my target, I'm claiming all the antibodies to that target. Uh, and even though they had 300 examples, the court said that they weren't diverse enough and so they couldn't make the broad claim that they had. What that meant was that the patent protection for that drug uh, got pretty well wiped out. Um, and uh, the reason for that is that the functionally defined genus, in other words, a way of saying anything that binds to my target, any antibody that works in this way, that is not something that you're able to claim under this legal doctrine. So the, the patent was invalid. So uh, for some reason, this case didn't get the attention it deserved at the time. And uh, so the issue came up again recently in a highly publicized case involving uh, uh, PCSK9 antibodies. These are uh, supposed to reduce bad cholesterol. So Amgen had a patent that uh, claimed all the antibodies that bound to particular parts of their target. Um, and Amgen won at trial. It was, I think, a fairly easy jury verdict win for them. But then the Federal Circuit reversed on this written description uh, uh, ground. It went up to the Supreme Court in the past year. Uh, the Supreme Court denied cert so that uh, it had to go back for another trial. The jury again said that the claims were valid. And then the district court reversed that and said, uh-uh, uh, under the law as we have it now, these claims are invalid. So the takeaway from this is that even though all those companies in Kendall Square are thinking day and night about what targets are they going to protect, once they do that, their job is only half over because not only are they going to have to discover one antibody that really works excellently against that target, they're going to have to discover a whole range of them. Otherwise, their competitors are going to be able to come along and do exactly that. So I think that um, this is likely to increase the price of drugs because, you know, I, I get a newsletter that, that talks about all the phase one, two, and three clinical trials that have failed after the expenditure of tens of millions of dollars. And of course, given how hard it is to get a drug that goes all the way through that, people really want to charge their pound of flesh once they actually have hit the jackpot and had one of the few medications that gets through that process. So, as was mentioned earlier today, there is proposed legislation afoot that would solve some of these problems of the incoherence of current jurisprudence under Section 101. And tacked on to the end of that is this proposal here about what to do about 112. However, this proposal is actually to say you have to be precisely limited to what is in your uh, specification. Um, you cannot get anything broader than that. So this would make it really, really difficult, even much more difficult than it is now, to get a patent that really does an effective job of excluding competitors, which is sort of the engine of, of pharmaceutical development. 
Now, you can argue about whether we need as many uh, tar targeted pharmaceuticals as we have and whether this incentive system is the one that we want. And that, I think, is for another day or perhaps for the Q&A. Um, but if you think that we do want to provide incentives for innovation, I think it's a fair question to ask, how should research, because biological research is pretty much entirely based on functional observations, how can those inventions actually be uh, protected to provide incentives for pharmaceutical development. So that's it. Thanks. So we now have about uh, 14 minutes from both Q&A, but also conversations amongst yourself as a panel. So if possible, one of you has something you want to say to the other or a question to ask, please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll have also people line up behind the uh, so I am a 112 nerd, so I have a 112 question, right? Um, how is the proposed legislation different from what's already on the books now? Um, by on the books, do you mean? The by on the books, are you referring to statutory? Yeah, yeah so like how, how does the proposal for section 112F differ from current section 112F? Current under the, under the current interpretations, you mean? Well, I, sorry, I, I, I guess what does the legislation, um, what language does the legislation, the proposed legislation amend in section 112F? Um, oh, uh, so, um, okay, so, all right, we're going to get even more obscure here. There's a part of it that, uh, that, it, that refers to um, claims that are called means plus function claims. So that if you use particular magic words, then you are in fact limited to exactly what you have put in your specification. This um, new legislation would essentially apply um, the same requirements to a different area of the law without requiring the magic language. What that would do, among other things, I think, is greatly increase the amount of uncertainty associated with claims of that type. Because right now, people know that if you've used the magic words, that's what you're doing and what you're intending. And if you don't use the magic words, that's not what you're intending. However, uh, this uh, legislation would essentially apply that principle um, while loosening itself from the magic words. So I think it would be yet another thing that would cause more litigation uncertainty. So I used to do patent litigation. That was my main thing. Uh, cases sometimes cost upwards of eight figures to figure these things out. And the more new rules that you have, the more expensive it becomes. So um, this is another, I think, very damaging complication. Patent law is already way more complicated than it should be to function effectively for what it should be doing in our society. And so uh, I'm not in favor of this. I also wanted, sorry, I also wanted to um, just add something to what Claire had talked about earlier. And she may have left this out just for brevity, but it's for those of you who are nodding off to sleep, you might find this amusing and wake you up a tiny bit. Written description, there's, there's actually been controversy about whether it really exists as a patent requirement at all. And there's a sort of a legend of a missing or added comma that may or may not have divided a single requirement into two separate requirements, thus causing the courts to bend over backwards and turn itself into turn themselves into pretzels to to imagine that there were two different things. Um, I won't say you know one way or the other. Although Eva, the Eli Lilly case in 2010, I think, put that to rest and said you know we're not going to deal with that. But there is this wonderful quote from um, Brandeis. I think it's from Brandeis, which is, when the mistake becomes often enough, long enough and often enough, the mistake becomes the law. And that may be why we have the written description requirement for better, for worse. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, if the patent law, I'm not a patent lawyer. OK, I'm a lawyer, but not a patent lawyer. <laughs> if the patent law is vague and overbroad, so vague and overbroad that the courts repeatedly find patents invalid, will that? inhibit discovery? I mean, are people going to want to bother getting, doing things because if, if it's not going to give them a patent? Or is it, are most people more altruistic and, and interested? So I just want to clarify two separate things. So first is whether or not the law itself is overbroad, right? And the second is whether or not it's confusing. We can imagine something that's narrow and confusing. We can imagine something that's broad and confusing, two kind of separate things. 
On the confusing side of things, right, it's not free to uh, file for a patent application, especially if you have your company writing on it. And so there are some instances, uh, there's actually a blog out there called Bilski blog, uh, which is named after this Supreme Court case, also in the Section 101 context, that tracks a number of cancer immunotherapy applications, among many other things, that were abandoned following Alice because the applicants couldn't make heads or sense about whether it was worth to prosecute their patents or not. So to the extent you think that that's the abandonment of discovery, that's possible. But the reality is this, right? You know, patent law has waxed and waned throughout US history. You're going to have a difficult time convincing me that the rate of innovation in the United States not only is not at a fever pitch, but is not increasing as of late. So I, I, I would take some of the claims that like when we do stuff to patent law, research stops. I would just like as a historical matter, just like take that with a grain of salt because the, the historical precedents are just the opposite. Okay, so <laughs> let me respond to that. First of all, in terms of getting a patent, the process is fairly well understood. And while it's hyper-technical, there are hyper-technical lawyers that deal with it. The problem that I have is when there are things like the situation where the rules change. So in 2008, the rules are so well settled that you can get these kinds of antibody patents that the patent office even issues a guidance saying that. Then just a few years later, the Supreme Court, or sorry, the Federal Circuit in this case, which is the top patent court, comes along and says, actually, no. And, and, and that's what I'm troubled by, is the fact that the rules keep changing. Like these 101 rules knocked out a number of very, very important, valuable patents. And so it's kind of like you're playing um, a really high stakes game. But instead of it being chess, it's more like uh, what, what's uh, Candyland, that game where you actually have no ability through your own skill to affect the outcome. Uh, and <laughs> Tell that, that to my five-year-old. My, when my kid first played that game, he wept a river when he lost and then learned how to play chess. Anyway, um, so what troubles me about this is, is the changing of the rules. But in terms of innovation, I would disagree, actually, that this has an impact on innovation. I think that there has been a real and material impact uh, on innovation in the diagnostics industry because it's practically impossible to get a diagnostic patent these days. Um, I mean, you can get a diagnostic patent uh, that will pass muster, but then it's likely to run afoul of a bunch of other sort of practical problems that also exist. So no, I think it's had a material impact on innovation. I think right now the pharmaceutical industry is sort of riding the last uh, crest of the wave and that that's partly a matter of the business cycle. But when you look, um, I think that there have been distinct sort of policy things that have changed. Uh, so for example, the Federal Circuit, that top patent court, was created in the 80s in part in response to a perception that uh, investment had lagged because of legal uncertainty when there was no top patent court. So I think that there's actually a lot of debate about innovation policy that is reasonable and legitimate to have. And I don't think it's fair to say that innovation is just going to be what it is, regardless of what the law is. I would just add to that that um, patent law has a unique challenge, I think, in the law. FDA law might come close to it in the sense that it's highly technical, highly specific. And it's also dealing with highly technical, highly specific real knowledge from science and technology. And the two of those are trying to deal with one another dynamically over time. And I think they overshoot and miss each other quite often. But um, whether or not they get it right or wrong, it's really hard to deal with two very dynamic bodies of knowledge that are trying to um, you know, reconcile with one another. Hi, my name is Phoebe. I'm a second year at the law school. Um, I just wanted to ask us just to understand the broader context, how 101 eligibility or 112 written description compare with the other challenges to validity, whether that's obviousness or novelty. Um, just in terms of what patent attorneys, prosecutors, and litigators are most worried and concerned about and what keeps them up at night and whether that's changing moving forward. So um, what they're worried about. I mean, so every case is different. Every case has its own foibles, right? And so I think on a case-by-case -case basis, it's going to depend on the patent that you're dealing with, either on the patent holder side or on the defense side. I will say that non-obviousness probably presents, it, it, it comes up in every single patent infringement case, just kind of period. Um, and also, because it's so reliant on documents, it's relying on the prior art, it's relying on what people had done previously. Um, 
it tends to form the bulk of discovery costs in a patent case related to validity as opposed to infringement, right? Um, not so in Section 101. Like, like I said earlier, Section 101, there is no person having ordinary skill in the art standard. It's like, is it an abstract idea? According to whom? Who cares? Right? Like, that's essentially how it works. Um, so in that sense, it's just attorney argument. Now, depending upon which attorneys you hire, sometimes attorney argument can be cheaper than doing document discovery. Sometimes it could be more expensive. Um, so that depends. The, the current state of uncertainty with 112, especially in the antibody area, like, like that's going, you know, that's gonna, it presents a lot of challenges now. Um, I can imagine that that is going to increasingly become a worry, both in the litigation management side, but also on the like predictability and litigation side for lawyers moving forward. That's my guess. I mean, so I spent my career litigating patents, and um, every case involves a prior art challenge. Uh, and, and it's interesting because um, prior art is really, I think, the most genuine, legitimate um, objection that can be made to patents. They're often pretty difficult technical judgments that need to be made about whether something is obvious or not. Um, What's interesting is that it's, uh, w most uh, patent cases are tried to juries, and it's really, really hard to get a jury to think that a patent is invalid over prior art. Um, I've tried many times, and uh, basically what happens is the, the patent holder gets up, and you know their inventors tell a story of how they had this terrible problem, and they worked night and day to try to figure it out, and then they had their eureka moment, they applied for the patent, and then two years later they found that somebody else was doing the exact same thing and they were crushed, and that was how this patent lawsuit began. So then I get up there trying to um, defend the accused infringer, and I put up like a photocopy of an article and say, well, you know, this article actually means that this patent is not valid. Juries never believe that. Um, so. Uh, although it, it is really the most important thing and a real genuine debate in the patent office, um, it's often not really that successful when it comes to the way that most of these cases get decided. And I actually found that I had better luck making those kind of equity-oriented arguments where I would say, look, these people discovered this one little thing and then they tried to claim the entire universe. Not fair. That was one that I could get a jury to understand. Um, so when you're getting patents, I think it's really all about the prior art. When you're defending them later, it's like, are you going to fall into the booby trap of 101, or can a, a good adversary uh, make an excellent 112 argument? But really, um, as the patent holder, my biggest thing that used to keep me up at night is, wow, the rules keep changing. And so this thing that I thought was good two years ago might not be good anymore. And that's really a bummer. How? What am I going to do about that? How am I going to? justify the validity of my patent now that the law's changed. This could be our last two minutes, so one quick question and a quick answer, and then we'll take our break. Uh, also not a patent lawyer. The, the, I, I hear you struggling with the, the dilemma, you know, innovation, public health, patent, no patent. Is there any resolution in what a patent grants? Does it have to be an absolute monopoly on the license for the product? Are there other solutions that could help solve this problem, and then there's a way of executing that. So patents are limited to their claims. You get narrow claims, you have a narrow right to uh, what you can exclude others from doing, right? There, there are many other innovation exclusivities out there, and uh, FDA exclusivities are probably a really great uh, example of that. And you know, some companies actually rely on those more heavily than their patents these days. So um, there are other choices. Patents can be narrow or broad, depending upon how they're drafted and who's willing to fight about them. You can also license them broadly. I mean, certain platform technologies are uh, licensed broadly to the entire uh, biopharma industry at relatively low rates. Um, so, you know, and, and you could, I could envision a policy change in which you shouldn't be able to enforce a patent unless you are either using it yourself or licensing it to somebody else to use it. That way, at least the technology, um, you, you have some stake in the technology before you can enforce it. There also are alternative systems to patents, open source, for example, or as um, Steve Chevelle has um, written a lot about bounties, for example, for particular inventions. So the patent system is one system, and there's a al set of alternative systems that we could opt for on a policy basis. Great. Please join me in thanking this panel. <clears throat>